Just put 
every disgusting thing they could think of. Some of them had pillowcases and towels wrapped around each other's necks in some kind of awful context. As some of these brave patients seemed in danger of strangulation, he ordered attendants to restrain them, but no attendants were available. Well, we'll start with morphine and a curare derivative nurse. Sorry, doctor, the morphine stocks are exhausted on the older patients. They go into the most awful spasms of the head doctors. At this terrible pronouncement, the doctor turned pale as death. He slumped to the floor in a faint, his face covered with red blotches. By the time they got his clothes off his body, it was also affected. And spontaneous orgasms were observed. Most distasteful thing I ever said still for. He killed himself later, but it's still an easy score. He recovered from the fear because of his addiction, and the word went out to junk was the only insurance against the fever. No stemming the black market, the government can seize and legalize. Now begins a deadly war of extermination between the junkies and the fever freaks. Here's the old junkie CO, take the young lieutenant on his round. They're out there, son, voice beyond the barbed wire and thunderous, waiting, watching, catching every filthy thing in their disease minds and bodies. They'll sell you red hot for junk, give you a nasty sex bath. They want a fever world. That's what we have to deal with out here. Well, perhaps sometime, somewhere, the human race will remember it. You white men stood between them and the fever. What an old wind bag. Where is my bed? Oh, I'm sure I'd rise in here for some water jays three times a day. Captain, that is short. Sure. We have to ration it down. God help us if we ever run out and fall in our hands. Where you'll kill me first, sir? Of course, of course. The army always. The army always. <laughs> The hipster bebop junkie never showed at the 103rd Street. The 103rd Street boys were all over time. Thin, sallow faces, bitter, twisted mouths, stiff fingered, stylized gestures. There's a junk gesture that marks the junkie like the limp breast marks the bag. The hand swings out from the elbow, stiff fingers, palm up. They were of various nationalities and physical types, but they all looked alike somehow. They all looked like junk. There was Irish, George the Greek, Ed upon Rose, Louis the Bellhop, Eric the Fag, Beagle, the Sailor, and Joe the Max. Several of them are dead now. Others are doing time. There are no more junkies at the 103rd and Broadway waiting for the connection. The connection has gone somewhere else, but the feel of junk is still there. It hits you at the corner, follows you along the block, then falls away like a discouraged panhandler as you walk on. Joe the Max had a thin face with a long, sharp, twitchy nose and a down curving toothless mouth. Joe's face was lined and ravaged, but not old. Things had happened to his face, but Joe was not touched. His eyes were bright and young. There was a gentleness about him, common to many old-time junkies. You could spot Joe blocks away. In the anonymous city crowd, he stood out sharp and clear, as though he was seeing him through binoculars. He was a liar, and like most liars, he was constantly changing his stories, altering time and personnel from one telling to the next. One time he would tell a story about some friend. Next time he would switch the story around to give himself the lead. He would sit in the cafeteria over coffee and pound cake, talking at random about his experiences. We knew that 
this Chinaman has some stuff stashed, and we try every way to make him tell us where it is. We have him tied to a chair. I like matches. He made a gesture of lighting a match and put them under his feet. He won't say nothing. I feel so sorry for that man. Then my partner hit him in the face with his gun, and the blood pumped all down his face. He put his hands over his face and drew them down to indicate the flow of blood. When I see that, I turn sick to my stomach, and I say, let's get out of here and leave the man alone. He ain't going to tell us nothing. Louis was a shop but lost what nerve he ever had. He wore a long, shabby, black overcoat that gave him the look of a furtive buzzer. Thief and junkie stuck out all over him. Louis had a hard time making it. I heard that one time he'd been a stool pigeon, but the time I knew him, he was generally considered right. George the Greek did not like Louis and said he was just a bum. Don't ever invite him to your home, he'll take advantage. He'll go on and nod in front of your family, he's got no class for him. George the Greek was the admitted arbiter of this set. He decided who was right and who was wrong. George prided himself on his integrity. I never beat no one. George was a three-time loser. Next time meant life as an habitual criminal. So his life narrowed down to the necessity of avoiding any serious involvement. No pushing, no stealing. He worked from time to time on the docks. He was hemmed in on every side, and there was no way for him to go but down. When he couldn't get a job, which was about half the time, he drank and took goo balls. He had two adolescent sons who gave him a lot of trouble. George was half sick most of the time in this period of scarcity. He had no match for these young louts. His face bore the marks of a constant losing fight. The last time I was in New York, I couldn't find George. The 103rd Street boys are scattered now, and no one I talked to knew what happened to George the Greek. Fritz the janitor was a pale, thin little man who gave the impression of being crippled. He was on parole after doing five years because he scored for a pigeon. The pigeon was hard up for someone to turn in, and the narcotics agent urgently needed to make an arrest. Between them, they built Fritz up to a big-time dope peddler and smashed a narcotics ring with his arrest. Fritz was glad to attract so much attention, and he talked complacently about his nickel in Lexington. The fag was a brilliantly successful lush worker. His scores were fabulous. He was the man who gets to the lush first. Never the man who arrives on the scene when the lush is lying there with his pockets turned inside out. A sleeping lush comes as a clock on the train. Generally, it works the other.